Good evening. Welcome you to our six o'clock service. We invite you to open your hymn books as we begin our service this evening to hymn 260. As they're turning, I welcome you who are with us on the live stream here tonight as well. We're going to ask you to remain seated as we'll sing the first and the last of the verses. Hymn 260 is my name written found it I invite you to stand here in the building I've seen the lightning flashing and heard the thunder roll never alone we'll sing the first the third and the last verses one three and four singing here this evening and I trust that maybe I can tie 
some of these hymns into the message of the evening, and the Lord will speak to our heart even before we get to his word. We're going to open with prayer. I would remind you of the request that we mentioned this morning, the evangelist. I heard nothing through the afternoon from him. We still have the surgery scheduled on Tuesday that we're asking the Lord to help and intervene with. And then I did neglect, uh, and it was mentioned, I believe, in at least the adult Sunday school class, uh, we have a, a bereavement in our church. Now, when I say that, it touches families in our church. The one who's passed away didn't attend here, uh, but it was pretty close to home, and there's some heavy burdens, and there are some uh, serious needs ongoing related to this. So um, we ought to lift them up in prayer, and then, of course, ask the Lord uh, to bless our service here this evening. Let us pray. And Father, as we open our service now, we, in, in um, respect to our Savior, ask his uh, blessing upon these things. May we reflect well upon uh, the gospel, and the word of God, and our Savior. And as we go through the song service and then into the word of God, that the Holy Spirit could do great work in our own hearts and from there on out into our world at large. We pray for the needs that we have. We, we had this evangelist reach out and asking for prayer to uh, strengthen and bring healing to him and his wife. We pray for the upcoming surgery scheduled on Tuesday and all the, the real concerns that are there. And uh, we would pray for those who aren't able to be with us uh, due to various uh, sicknesses uh, out and about. And then for this family that's in the uh, bereavement and uh, the need of encouragement and uh, support that's there and uh, that uh, the hand of God would be great and, and that there would be much honor and glory uh, on, on this uh, hard situation. Bless our service and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may be seated. We'll continue on singing hymn 203. 203. Um, of course, this ties into this morning when we preached on uh, being forgiven. Whosoever will is a powerful uh, hymn connected to that scripture. It will tie in, though, to tonight's message as well. We'll sing all the verses.
Uh, by way of announcements, tomorrow we'd appreciate your praying as the uh, youngsters finish the basketball season on an away game up into uh, Slippery Rock. Uh, the uh, fourth, the Saturday, is the meet and greet. Uh, and if you can't be at that again, we would encourage you and ask you to be praying about all those matters. Um, and that contemplates a wedding on April 1st. <laughs> so, uh, and you please pray, all right? I guess is the way to say all that. We do have upcoming uh, meetings, and I, I guess I got you practicing voting here just a moment ago. Um, there are things to that'll be discussed, uh, officers to be elected, uh, matters to be transpired, and to uh, recollect what happened in the previous uh, year. And today would be the last of what we call our church year. So we're gonna ask our men to come, we'll have prayer and take the last offering of this year. How's that sound? And uh, we will up again uplift those who serve in the nation of India. I mentioned a lot this morning about them. Let us pray. Father, as we uh, take the offering and as we uh, give to the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ, especially for the reach of the gospel, both into the hearts of the lost and into the growing of saints, that we'd be faithful in this business. We do ask that you would uh, help those who serve in India with this uh, recent move by the authorities to uh, make this uh, preaching of the gospel a crime. And we ask that you would help our, our servants there to, to serve faithfully and well, and that you'd bring the, the um, machinations of the old whip, wicked one to, to uh, a brutal and violent end. May they find great uh, freedom and release in the presentation of the gospel. We thank you. You've afforded to all of us all authority, all power to proclaim this being the day of the Lord's salvation. Uh, bless the gift, the giver, and those unable or unprepared. Lord, and we thank you for what you are going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. How many want to hear that again? Since we're voting, right? Thank you so very much for that. That was wonderful. Hymn 498, before we look into God's word, and I'll ask you to stand one last time, and we'll sing all the verses. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. All the verses as we sing standing.
that's the kind of hymn that makes a Presbyterian shout, isn't it? Please shake hands with one another, make each feel welcome. I walked into the church building with one introduction and I have two. As I got here, I was offered kindly an actual plumb line on earth. And we've been talking about this this year, about being right. And there's nothing wrong with a visual to reinforce that. According to the law of science and our planet, if this... Uh, Bob on the end, this end, not this end, this Bob on, on this end will stop wiggling. The yellow string going up above it ought to be perfectly perpendicular with the surface that we're standing on. Um, and uh, I don't, can you see the, the beautiful machining work on that? And, and yet as fine and as beautiful as this is, it doesn't compare to our Lord and Savior, does it? So uh, this may come out again. We may use this to continue to illustrate righteousness. Uh, but I w want to bring you to my second introduction. And it, it, it's, it starts off with a serious, it's not a, a humorous story. The, the fella who uh, invented and produced and marketed the Auric vacuum cleaner died this recent days. He's 99 years old. Um, he uh, was a World War II vet and a serious entrepreneur. He really could have gone to college, but he chose instead to get in the business of selling televisions and uh, dishwashers and uh, then into vacuum cleaners. He was highly successful with the vacuum cleaner, and, and uh, some of you would attest to that because at your house you have one or two or several or... Um, I'm not sure, I'm not worried about that because I'm going to tell you what happened next. As part of his success in, uh, in business in that world, he was asked to often give speeches on um, how to do business to aspiring business people, college students, uh, young executives, and he, he was a firecracker. He was quite the American individual. And one day he was in the Philadelphia area at, I believe, Drexel University, and he was uh, to give a speech, and after he was introduced, they all applauded, and it was a polite way to greet someone to the platform. And he got up and he gave one of the most memorable of all replies to his um, um, ovation. He said he did not believe in his entire life that any vacuum cleaner salesman ever got such a reception. Now, after that elaborate introduction, I want to ask you to turn to Zechariah 8. And as you turn, this is why, why this merits some, some consideration. I'm merely the messenger. I did not create this. I did not produce this. And I'm not really selling anything. But I am delivering you incredible news, the, the likes of which, if you really believed, you would applaud, give me an ovation for bringing your attention to Zechariah chapter 8. And if you really believe it, know it as an eternal truth, it would be much more loud and much more um, uh, enjoyable to hear. Not me, but on what the Lord has said. We began in this study last week in Zechariah 7 at the request of a couple gentlemen who were very, very weary of doing church stuff. And their question, if you remember, was, do we still have to go to church? I put it into our language. They spoke to a certain special day, a memorial day, a day of sadness. 
And they were to fast on that day. And it was the day in the end of July, our calendar, or the 1st of August, our calendar. This past year, it was the first week of August when this occurred. The 9th of Av, A-V, the month of. And I went through a list of all sorts of disasters that have befallen these people on that particular day. And so, as part of that process, humanly speaking, they chose to make it a fast day. God never gave it to them out of the book of Moses. It wasn't something that was in the law anywhere, but it was agreed upon by the survivors of all their devastation. We ought to, like, somehow put this one on the calendar and, and not celebrate it as a joyful moment, but a fast. But they'd done it for 70 years, and it was burdensome. They don't say it that way, but you can hear in God's answer to them uh, the issue. And he went right to the heart of the matter. That was chapter 7. That question is still on God's mind as we go into chapter 8. But the tone changes a little bit. And we're going to read some verses here, but I want you to know chapter 8 breaks into two solid parts. The first 17 verses, and then the remaining from verse 18 to 23. In the first 17 verses, God makes some discussion about who he is and who his people are. It's almost like he's telling these men who asked that question, or anybody else who's asked the question in his, at least his heart, why do I still have to do church? God wants to tell them some things. And so those verses are filled with unbelievable information getting to the very heart of the matter. And I'm using the word heart now, not like I did this morning, but as maybe the bullseye, right where the rubber meets the road, as we say. And uh, so let's, re let's read here a couple verses. Again, the word of the Lord of hosts came to me saying, and as I say that, you should know, God's not letting the matter die. You come to ask God a question, be ready for an answer. These, I'm sure these two men already heard all they wanted to hear <laughs> at the end of chapter 7. But God wasn't done answering. And uh, be careful what you ask for is the old adage, right? God's, oh, i got something else to say. Thus saith the Lord of hosts. Now, this is the second time you're going to see the Lord of hosts. This phrase, Lord of hosts, comes all the way through this passage. It's the God who is in his military gear. It's the God of the angel armies. It's the God of conquering. He's chosen not to speak as one of his other uh, positions he holds in this dealing. I, I find that fascinating that you come and say, I, I don't know about all this church stuff. I mean, really. And I'm speaking to the choir. You came Sunday night. It's like a lot of church stuff, Lord. You're, you're putting God in a position where he's going to put on his military gear. That's, that's impressive. Just... Just on the surface of it, that's impressive. Let's hear what he says. I was jealous for Zion with great jealousy. I was jealous for her with great fury. So he's telling in this next phrase, hey, I'm really interested in all this church stuff. I, I got everything I'm made out of all about this church stuff. Everything I am, every fiber of my being. That's, that's what he's saying here. God doesn't play church. He doesn't play around with church. Nothing involved with what he wants with his people is ever just a lark or a matter of foolishness. Not at all. And, and we know that primarily because of what happened to his only begotten son. That hasn't happened yet. But God has invested everything he is in his people. Thus saith the Lord, I am returned unto Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem shall be called a city of truth. And the mountain of the Lord of hosts, <laughs> of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. Thus saith the Lord of hosts. If you've not seen his uh, military gear on by now, you've been impressed with it on. Because how many times have we heard, I'm the Lord of all the armies. 
There shall yet old men and old women dwell in the streets of Jerusalem, and every man with his staff in his hand for a very age in the streets of the city shall be full, full of boys and girls playing in the streets thereof. I used to read this and think, wow, that's, that's pretty interesting. That's a sign. It's a, a, a city with people in it. Now, because of the country I live in myself, the United States of America, I'm aware of what's really going on here. Our old and our young are extremely vulnerable in all the streets. On my way here tonight, I caught on the news a blurb about New York City. There's a gang of four on mopeds stealing $568 uh, Apple iPhones off of uh, um, Apple ear muffs off of people's heads. They're finding people who are vulnerable and taking off of them what's not theirs. Uh, this description that we read in this verse, just at first blush, lets you know Jerusalem is a peaceful town. We also know we're not talking about Jerusalem right now. In our present day, Jerusalem is dangerous. There are uh, sirens that go off regularly. People who are not soldiers, just merely citizens, walk around in the streets with weaponry that's pretty impressive looking. Uh, everyone's impressed into military service at a certain age and you are, it's not, it's a mandatory draft, but they don't even call it that. It's part of being Jewish and part of trying to stay alive in a very dangerous spot of the world. This is, this is the apple of God's eye. So you know there's a destroyer who's doing everything he can to wipe it off the face of the planet. And he's got assistants running wild all over this planet from the United Nations in New York all the way around back to it again, who are also interested in making this a disaster zone. And so it's not a safe place, but it's not much different than Philadelphia or Minnesota or New York City, as I described, or Chicago or New Orleans. And I just heard the mayor down there is one step closer to being removed, being that it's one of the murder capitals. Do you play on the streets in any of these places? No. Not if you've got any sense. Well, as we, as we get through these verses, I'm going to stop reading there for a moment. I'm going to come right here. I'm calling this message tonight of chapter 8 of Zechariah, Jerusalem, ascendant and resplendent. And as I told you, if you understood what this book is going to say in this particular chapter, you'd be applauding your hands because we're speaking of the day in which the Messiah makes this city the jewel of all earth where the promises of Abraham are in full realization and the whole planet, not just Israel, but the whole planet is absolutely in love with peace. We sang just a moment ago, when we all get to heaven. And that's a, that's a, that's a heart cry we have for this world is not our home. But the Lord has promised us that in the future, he's going to bring heaven to earth. And for those 1,000 years, we're going to live on a planet like the Garden of Eden, which was supposed to have been our heritage forever and ever. We lost it, but the Lord has found a way to restore it. And chapter 8 of Zechariah is a, a microcosm of that restoration. I'm, just going to, I'm going to be reading here going forward also how there's going to be more peace, and there's going to be more joy, and there's going to be more delight, and there's going to be more wonder. And so these two men have come up with their entourage and said, do we still have to do church? And the Lord says, I'll tell you something about who I am and what I'm going to do said, I'm all in on this, and this is what's going on. And I want you to know, first of all, he's going to deal with truth. And this is important because you must understand Israel, these two men especially, but speaking on behalf of so many others, were unraveled and unsure about what whatever was true. They've been told, we're going to go back to the land. We're going to build this temple. We're going to have the Jerusalem restored. And it's going to be just like when David was king. And they came back, and it wasn't anything like that. It was hard work. It was being tormented by the old enemies we had before. It was political frustration. It was uh, turf wars inside the city and outside the city among the Jewish brethren. Uh, there was uh, trouble on every hand, gossip all around. It was turmoil. And they're thinking, this isn't like when uh, what we, uh, this isn't anything like what we thought at all. And on top of it, we still have to have church. 
and, and God said, I want, I want to talk to you who are unsure and unraveled by life. I want to give you truth. There's a couple things that I want you to know. I want you to see here. Verse 6, thus saith the Lord of hosts. Oh, there's his name again. If it be marvelous. The word means really a miracle. Means impossible outside of God's handiwork. That's the word marvelous here. In the eyes of the remnant of his people in uh, these days, should it also uh, be marvelous in mine eyes, saith the Lord of hosts. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, behold, I will save my people from the east country, from the west country, and I will bring them and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem and they shall be my people. I will be their God in truth and in righteousness. Now, what he's telling us, first of all, is the sanctity of this group. These are his People, they were put in a special category. And by the way, when you get saved, you don't enter into the family of Abraham. We, we enter into the body of Christ. But we become a chosen people, a royal priesthood. We are the elect of God. And I'm not proposing I'm a Calvinist from the pulpit by any means. But it is wonderful to know whosoever will are the elect of God. And I don't know a lot of things, but it's wonderful to say on the authority of God's word that there was a day when I said, whosoever is me, and God said, and you're mine. And you're mine. Now, Israel, who was stumbling around at this time when Zechariah was preaching, puzzled over that, but by him saying these things, they were reminded clear back when Abraham was around. If you saw me wince right now, it wasn't because I doubted what I said. It, my shoulder popped right there. It didn't feel good. <laughs> they remember what God had done with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the uh, exodus under Moses out of Egypt and the conquering of the land with Joshua, and the, the judges, and the history that we lead up into David, and the, and the majesty of that kingdom followed by the beauty and the glory that was Solomon's. And they would also have to realize that they had been warned over and over again that sin is a reproach to any nation. And even in that statement, they understood God's dealing. They truly knew by these statements the truth. And God was dealing with them in truth. And by the way, the application is really easy for us to follow in behind, just like I've done with being chosen by God too. God deals with us in a most special way. We are sanctified people. We may not be so saintly at times, but it's a real privilege to understand such a truth. And this city, Jerusalem, is going to be founded upon that very thought. It's not the people who get there. It's the king of kings who does this. And that's all that's in view here. We're going to be enjoying the millennium, not because of who we are or anything that we've done, but because of the God-man, Jesus Christ. So we have the sanctity of them. And I've already highlighted this. We have the sanctity of Israel. We have also, as I highlighted, with the older and the younger, the most vulnerable of the population, great safety. They're out running around in the streets. Well, I guess the older ones are on canes, but they're out in the streets. Enjoying life free from fear, free from harm. That's, that's something to, to grasp. All peoples of the world desire this. Uh, some of you are, are very frustrated because of the day in which we live. It, it, it's not a safe time. Uh, it's, it's, it's dangerous. And you've done things already in your world to uh, prepare and also to deal with some issues that have come across your path. Well, the Bible tells us when in chapter 8, you want to an answer to the question about why we do church stuff? There's a day coming in which the beauty of heaven is going to be ours to enjoy on earth. The sanctity of Israel, the safety uh, for Israel. And then if you were to read on verses 9, well, it, verse 8 segues into it, but going from verse 9 all the way to verse uh, 17, you are impressed with the Savior to Israel. Let's read in verse 8, and I will bring them, I will bring them, and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. 
And they shall be my people, and I will be their God in truth and in righteousness. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, there's that name again, let your hands be strong. Ye that hear in these days these words by the mouth of the prophets, which were in the, that the day of the foundation of the house of the Lord of hosts was laid, that the temple might be built. Now, why is the temple being built? Not just so that they have this edifice constructed, but it was to be a statement about the God of Israel. And that whole construction, every bit of it, pointed to the redemption, the ransom, the rescue, the restoration of he who is Jesus Christ. You can't go into that temple, a much more elaborate building than, of course, the tabernacle, but you can't go in there and think, well, I wonder what this has. Uh, I'll never know what this means. It, it's not true. When you start studying the temple, you begin to discover how God absolutely has made preparation for a day in which he will dwell with man. This is the, the work of the Savior. He, he wants this place built as a, sing, a signal and a statement about who he is. And so as we go on now through the rest of these uh, verses down to verse 17, he's going to say over and over again things that apply to him being the Savior. I won't go through all of them, but let's look at a couple of them. Um, Verse 11, now I will not be unto the residue of this people as in the former days, saith the Lord of hosts. There's that name again. He says, okay, the days of your suffering for your sin are past. In this time when such a place is constructed and I will be dwelling with you, the shame and the guilt is gone. The reproach that has fallen upon you absolutely because you deserve it has been removed. What is he saying? There was one who came and took it. There was one who came and bore it. There was one who came to set it aside and to say, it is finished. They're not dwelling here just because he wants to have a happy little Jerusalem. We're having a happy Jerusalem because God dealt with the real problem. It was sin. And he can say to them, it won't be like it's been. You've gone, because of your sin, through some deep water. You've gone through some fire. You've gone through brutal punishment. But I have taken care of that. Let's see what else we see with this Savior. Uh, let's go to um, verse 13. It shall come to pass that as ye were a curse among the heathen, O house of Judah and, and house of Israel, so will I save you. And ye shall be a blessing. Fear not, but your, let your hands be strong. Now remember, there's two guys standing there getting this lesson, right? They're getting way more than they bargained for. But I want you to consider some things here when he's talking about this. In this passage, this verse I just read to you, the Savior is going to recombine Israel. You and I can see how that's going to take place because there's really only one group of Israelites to this day who know who they are. The descendants of the high priest, for the most part, know who they are. Their last name uh, has given to them an understanding of who they've descended from. They know they're descended from Aaron. If you know anything about Khan's meat, anybody ever eat Khan's meat? Uh, anybody know someone with the last name Cohen? Cohen. Uh, these are all versions of the high priest. Those, that's the Hebrew word for the high priest. And any, any Jewish person with the name Cohen, Khan, any version of that is the group that know who they are. But the rest of them have no clue. They don't know who they might be. Uh, so to bring the, them back as one, the Lord has an effect by the by the foolishness of men and the despising of God by men managed to make the Israelites into one people again. It's amazing. And we've seen and been witness of this in our generation as they make uh, Elijah. I, okay, where's my Hebrew scholar in the room here? Have I said that well? Elijah? Close enough for English-speaking Gentiles? 
They, they've gone back to the land, and they're going back to the land, and they continue going back to the land, and they don't know what tribe they belong to except for that one group of the Levites, that one narrow group. But the rest of them don't know who they are. Uh, they might make good guesses, um, but, but they're coming back. Uh, that, that's, that's the working of our God in heaven. But let's, let's consider something else here. Not only do we find uh, a recombined people, a rebuilt a temple, uh, we find a respectful people. And I say respectful, people will respect them. They will no longer be a curse. They'll no longer be a despised uh, people. But it tells us a little bit about them. Verse 17, let none of you imagine evil in your hearts against the neighbor. At this point in time, you find the Ten Commandments by God's great work has been inserted into the heart. Up to this point in time, it was on stone. And there was a lot of resistance from hard hearts to the stone of God's commandments. And any time you tried to make the stone uh, give and take a little bit, it broke. You can't make stone give or break. God's law cannot be fudged with, moved around with, law you're eased. You can't play fast and loose. I, I heard a, a, a joke about... Um, this game, this, this guy was uh, on the shoreline. He was walking along the, uh, the shoreline. He had two lobsters. And a gay warden came up and said, Excuse me, sir, can I see your license? He said, Oh, I don't have one. He said, Well, you got two lobsters. She said, Oh, I don't need them for these. These are my pets. He said, What? I don't believe you. He said, yeah, I come down here every day, whistle. They come over to the shore. I grab them. We go for a walk. And after the walk, I put them back in the ocean. Here, I'll show you. And he threw him back in, and the, and the gay ward said, okay, whistle. He bring those lobsters back. He said, what lobsters? <laughs> yeah, I knew some of you would laugh on that. He, he, we're too related to that story, aren't we? Yeah, you can't do that with the law of Moses. It was written in stone, and there's no playing with it, else it breaks. But God did something better. He said, I'm going to give you a new heart. Book of Ezekiel talks about that great heart transplant. And he puts a new heart. And in this heart, he has written his law. And it's now served and obeyed, not because you have to, but because you love to. Because you want to. Oh, it sounds like those two fellows who were there saying, do we still have to go to church? Are getting it in, in double barrels right now, doesn't it? And they are. You don't have to do this because in your heart you want to do this. And, and, it, and it shows that you want to do this church stuff because of how you treat your neighbor. You're, you're the most respectful people now. And you love no false oath for all. And by the way, treating your neighbor is half of the law. Remember, there are two great commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, might. And the second is like unto it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Here, there, that's exactly what this is saying. Treating your neighbors nice, and where he says no false oath, that is loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and might. The full Ten Commandments are abbreviated in Zechariah's message here to these men who came under questions that they had. But from God himself, he said, look, I got two commands. That's all you have to... I don't want to hear you hate church stuff. I want to hear you say, I, I, I like my God in heaven, and I'm pretty... pretty Thrilled with who my neighbors are. And I don't even know them all yet. That's what I want to hear. We're talking when, when we find there's a savior in the land, we find a people who are respectful. They're respected and they're respectful. And uh, I could read also about the replenishing that comes, how the land uh, comes to life. But let's go to, to verses 18 through 23. And these verses talk about the future. We spoke about the truth because we had a people who were unraveled and unsure and God dealt with issues that were real close to home, how special they were, how safe they need to be, that they have a Savior. And then he says, I want to talk to you about your future. And they were also unsure about this. I know none of us can know the future. I don't mean it that way. I mean it the way we regularly think about it. Some of you may be concerned and hear about, well, what's going on with the economy? Uh, what's going on with the, the uh Government, oh, the, the terror that runs around in our streets now. Oh, and, and we could adopt the uh, Henny Penny 
style of theology where we just run for the sky because an acorn has hit us on the head? Or, 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 we, or we may be foolish enough to stick ourselves in the middle of all sorts of trouble and get run over by a semi? But the Bible gives us some information here that was, will and should guide us. And he speaks to the future. And I'd like you to see some things here. The word of the Lord of hosts came unto me saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the fast of the fourth month. Oh, he added another one. They came in asking about the, fifth, uh, the ninth of Av, that fifth month. Well, the Lord says, okay, I'll talk about church. <laughs> okay, the fast of the fourth, the fast of the fifth, the fast of the seventh, the fast of the tenth. Remember, they came about one and God said, I'll, I'll talk to you about fasting. I'll talk to you about what it means to be in church. I'll, I'll do this. Okay. This shall be to the house of Judah joy and gladness. God's going to take all these sad days, these days of, of, of heavy heartedness and bitter memories and troubles of the past. And he says, I'm going to turn all that into Feast days. By the addition of the letter E, he took the word fast and made it a feast. Did you notice that? This is going to be a feast. This is not going to be a fast. And by the way, when we contemplate the future, that's for us too. This is unique to Israel. I know they have a special place in so many ways. But God's chosen people are those who are also members of the bride of Christ. And as I quoted there from the book of 1 Peter, that we are a royal priesthood, a chosen generation. We, we are uh, the apple of our Lord's eye. He gave his life for us. Uh, and he has bought us with his precious blood that we should be to him a people, no longer aliens and outcasts, no longer members of, of the enemy and at enmity with God. He, he's brought us into a place of, of, as it says, Beulah land. What a beautiful thought that is, Beulah land. The land of wedded bliss. This millennium is our honeymoon. This millennium is when we get to see the groom, the Lord Jesus Christ, in his magnificence, in his majesty, as he uh, unleashes his grace and kindness and love upon this planet, and the curse has been destroyed. Uh, the uh, the uh, enemy has, has been barred in the abyss, and we see the, the sower catch up to the reaper. What a day is in front of us here. And, and so as we read in verse 19, he says to these fellows, okay, let me talk about all the things that you probably inside your heart are concerned about. How's that for a nice way to say it? Because it's a happy thought here. This is a good thing here. I want to I talk to you about your fasting question. There's going to be a day coming in which you're going to say, oh, it's another party. Oh, man, I want to be there. I wonder who I'm going to sit by. I wonder if we're going to be allowed seconds. I wonder what the Savior's best cut of steak tastes like. And those of you like kale, it, though, you can go over that end of the table. <laughs> if God's making the kale, is it going to be good? Oh, yeah, yeah. Just imagine how sweet the meat of a cow that ate is going to be. Wow. If the kale's that good, just imagine the steak. Isn't, isn't the basis of how good your steak is, is on what the thing ate going to it? Yeah. And those of you who eat shrimp and lobster and crab and snail, you know what they eat. No, don't go there. <laughs> okay, I want to expand on this feasting because now that the Lord brought that up, verses 20 down to 23, he says some wonderful things. And I think this last part's going to get you good. L just jump to verse 23. Thus saith the Lord of hosts. Oh, there's that name again. In those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold out of all languages of the nations, even take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, we will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Now remember, these were two Jewish fellows. They had non-Jewish names, but they were Jews, and they had been growing weary of the business of the Lord's house. They were tired of some of these things that were burdensome. And they said, do we still have to do this? And of course, 
they gotten a lot of yes <laughs> over and over and over again. But the last one's the zinger. And this is the really good part. He said, okay, I'll tell you what it's going to be like. Those, there's going to be a day coming when people who aren't Jews, bunches of them, ten of them are going to grab a hold of any Jew who's himself going to the feast, say, can we go with you? We want to go. We want to be there. Now, you know you've gotten a hold of someone's heart when they want to go to church and they're not part of your world. You know you've done some business in your neighborhood that when you're headed to church, they stop your car and say, hey, you got room for me? I want to go wherever it is you're going. I, I've seen and heard some things. I heard God is where you are. I want to go. That's something to chew on, isn't it? And, and that's what it's going to be like. He said, okay, here comes you Jewish fellows. You say, do we still have to go to church? He said, I'm going to tell you, there's going to be a day when people are going to be begging to come and see me. People who aren't of the Abraham line. People who don't speak any language like you. At all. They don't have no clue what you're saying in the Hebrew or, or Aramaic or Babylonian. They have no idea what you're saying, but they know they've heard God is with you. Now, this is the hinge verse going into the next chapters. The rest of this book is unbelievable, all about God is with you. By the way, I could give you the Hebrew word for we've heard God is with you. But I think you already know it. Emmanuel. For we have heard. Emmanuel. Emmanuel. Those two fellows with their entourage, I'm pretty sure after they heard all this from Zechariah, they were saying, let's never go back and ask him any questions. I'm pretty certain that they'd gotten their ears filled with news from God himself, the God of the armies. God showed up in his military gear. Give him this answer. But what an answer. What, what, a, what a contemplation to have. There's a day coming in which we're not going to think of this as burdensome or a problem or, or a difficulty or a, a cross hard to bear. This is not a cross hard to bear. The, this is a great privilege and anticipation of a day in which the Lord has really reserved the beauty and the glory of his salvation fully revealed. Up to that point in time, we get to believe it. Have faith that it's coming. Trust the God who already said you're special and he's backed it up. And trust the God who has made things safe for you and he's backed it up. And trust the God who has uh, been a savior and backed it up. That's who's running this show. And whenever it is you get weary and well-doing about, remember there's a day coming which Ten people are going to be grabbing at you to say, we've heard Emmanuel. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, what a powerful uh, chapter this, this part of Zechariah is. And, and an actual set of men came with a, 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 a very plain spoken uh, question. And in your most... Kind rebuke, you gave us uh, great insight of, of what really matters. And you've changed uh, the idea of a griping and complaining heart to a heart of hope and anticipation. A heart that is grieved with doing right to a heart that's thrilled with an opportunity to do more right. An opportunity to praise the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for the powerful teaching Zechariah presents to us. And I ask, Lord, that you would give us a heart, as you described in this passage, of wonder and to know this is truly going to be marvelous, a work of impossibility by the great hand of God. With your heads bowed and eyes shut, I, in the study, haven't given strong invitations, but tonight I, I would. If in your heart the... the work of the Lord's become somehow a burden, which is hard to say to a Sunday night crowd. You've stepped away from life to make it here tonight. But if you know your heart needed some refreshing on this great truth, and there's some matters the Lord's dealing with, as we would sing our hymn, 
I invite you here to the steps to spend a little bit of time with the Lord. Of course, you can handle it right where you are, and you ought to, by the way. But sometimes it pays to step out and firm it up. Uh, if in this you're like those two fellows, I still don't like church, maybe your real question is, am I truly saved? Whether here in the building or online, uh, I would let you know that uh, a heart that doesn't know him as the Savior won't want anything to do with him in fellowship and delight. And the first need of the hour is to be born again. Ask Christ to be the Savior. Ask him to forgive uh, of sin and sinfulness and to change the heart. And I would ask you to consider that tonight. And having said consider, I would try to uh, cajole you or beg you too. This is most important. We're, we're pleading with your soul. And this is a matter that is eternal. Not just for the time being. And so as we bring our service to a close, I stir and challenge you with these thoughts. Let us stand as we'll sing a hymn here in invitation and closing. And Father, as we stand to sing, if one or several need to do some business with you, in light of this great hope, in light of this great promise, in light of this future, based on the truth of our Savior, I ask that you would do great work in their heart. Oh, how we thank you that you are a loving and forgiving God, that you have provided great grace and extended um, everlasting mercies uh, to uh, Adam's sin-cursed race. Father, I would pray that you would touch our hearts and draw us ever so closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. And I know it's an unusual invitation, but the hymn we sang right before catches the flavor of chapter 8, When We All Get to Heaven. I know it's an unusual verse, but if you need to come forward, maybe you'll come up at a run. <laughs> sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his, what's the next word? Now you know why I've asked you to sing this as we close. Sing. Requests. And Father, as we dismiss, we ask you give us safety on our, uh, to our appointed places and to the schedule we have before us. Lord, we ask that we would be uh, the kind of people that are glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. Lord, it's, it's an honor and a privilege. And as you reminded us through Zechariah's great preaching, uh, it's going to be the, the uh, greatest thing in the millennium. Oh, Lord, may we, even before then, live our lives in such a way that we honor our Savior. Bless us as we go our separate ways. May we be faithful to the gospel. May we speak well of our Lord. And I pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people say, amen. amen. Good, after, or good evening. God bless you. <laughs>